Okay, so let's go. All right. Okay. This afternoon, I'm very happy to meet somebody I've not uh, laid my eyes on since 1976, I believe, but uh, we, we crossed paths when he interviewed me about my recording of The Baker's Wife. His name is Paul Lazarus. He's in California. He's a teacher and uh, involved in many interesting activities. So Paul, tell, tell us, how did you get involved with Broadway? Uh, let's see. I guess I guess I would have to go all the way back to seeing company on Broadway as a teenager, and that was a re remarkable show at the time for a young person. And uh, I remember looking up at the stage and thinking, "Whatever that is, I want to do it." And uh, uh, especially when Elaine Stritch was singing things like uh, "Ladies Who Lunch," uh, it's a bit of a revelation. But I, you know, I was a child performer performed in high school and college and uh, lost the bug for performing probably about college age and started directing and really been doing that ever since. And somewhere along the way in New York uh, after school, someone, I, I had said, you know, I did, used to do a radio show at Dartmouth about musical theater, play songs by the likes of Cole Porter, George Gershwin and, uh, various people I had in those days that they were records. Um, and uh, I think it was Miles Kruger said, you ought to do that in New York. Nobody's doing a radio show about musical theater and it's New York. And I took a look around and sure enough, no one had a radio show about the American musical theater in New York City at the time. And this was 1979, late 70s. So I started doing this radio show and I called it Anything Goes after the Cole Porter song. And uh, it started on, started on weekdays because it was on WBAI-FM and uh, they didn't know what to make of a show about musicals, even though it was New York. So they gave me Mondays and Wednesday mornings and I had a two and a half hour show. It quickly got very popular and uh, because it was filling a void for I guess a lot of people in those days. And they switched me to a very prime spot on Sunday at 12.30. And I was on Sunday at 12.30 on WBAI-FM for many, many years. And I interviewed everybody from the very young Alan Menken at that point, all the way to Sondheim and Mickey Grant and on and on and on, eight years worth of shows. And uh, cut to about 40 years later, and a friend of mine, Steve Cole, who you, you may have interviewed on this program, Steve Cole said, hey, whatever happened to your Anything Goes radio program? And I said, oh, God, I haven't thought about it for uh, many years. He said, that should be a podcast. And uh, had not, literally had not occurred to me that I was sitting on eight years worth of podcasts because they were radio shows. And that's so why I called up some friends and now it's on the Broadway Podcast Network as a rebroadcast of these old radio shows. It's kind of, uh, but uh, you know, I earned my living mostly as a director and uh, have been teaching a little bit as well uh, at the University of Southern California and uh, live in Los Angeles now. So do you intend to play every broadcast? Well, I'm, I'm trying to, but uh, you know, part of it is finding the materials. Uh, luckily, a lot of it was donated to the um, Library of Congress and they've been very, very gracious about sending me back these cassettes. And some of these shows are on cassettes. Uh, as, as you well know, Bruce, uh, in those days we used this expensive reel-to-reel -reel tape and it was called, uh, you know, the best I think it was called Ampex 406 or something. Well, that expensive reel-to-reel -reel tape has basically deteriorated over the years. And all of the particles that apparently got the good sound have fallen off. <laughs> but the crappy plastic tape that we considered to be the bad tape, that's the stuff that lasted. So a simple little cassette that was basically tape made out of plastic that survives to this day, but the expensive stuff <laughs> that had all these fancy chemicals on it, that's, that didn't survive. So, uh, I so hope you, 
I you have a list of do you have a list of all the shows? Or you know? Oh yeah, I, I did hundreds of shows and I luckily uh, documented most of it uh, at the time. And uh, we're just trying to find it. Right now, my assistant is digitizing interviews with the likes of Burton Lane and Paul Gemignani and you know Julie Stein uh, in an effort to uh, reclaim this material that's literally almost 40 years old. Crazy. Did, did you play whole albums ever, or what was your no, general approach? No, I, 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 the the approach on the old radio show was never to be um, playing whole albums. It was usually the the hope or the intent, and and uh, and often I just didn't have the time to pull this off. But the intent was to have a writer, a lyricist, a composer. Um, uh, you know, uh, orchestrator, a musical director, a director, a co costume designer, anybody involved with the Broadway, talk about the work and then play the song from the album. <coughs> you would be hearing that song, I hope in a different way. I mean, the idea was if you heard Julie Stein talking about writing people, and then you heard Barbara Streisand sing people, you would hear the song I guess in a different way. That that was the intent of the show. It was never just to play the whole album of of uh, Funny Funny Girl, which by the way would have been a lot easier, but that wasn't the intent of the show. The intent of the show was to hopefully illuminate the process of creating these, you know, breathtaking moments, not just play them. All these people had to come to WBAI. This is in, uh, in most person. of them came to my my apartment in New York and sat down with me for an hour or two. We did, the, we did a very long-winded, detailed interview, and then I would take the interview and cut out the parts that I wanted to play for the listeners. So it was, it was a kind of an intense process. It would be like I would interview, let's say, um, Julie Stein on a Tuesday, and we'd do an hour and a half interview. And then I would take the cassette of the interview and dub the parts that I thought were worth hearing or exemplary onto reel-to-reel -reel tape, edit them, take out all the pauses, take out the coughs, take out any stuff I didn't really wanna waste time playing on the air, which by the way, in those days involved a, a razor blade and the edit block and, and uh, edit tape, which many people have never seen at this point, but. I would stand at this reel-to-reel -reel deck and create these interview moments. And then usually live in the studio, I would mix the interview mo moment with the, a recorded song from an album or, yeah, in those days it was mostly records. So I'd have the record queued up on a little player. I think there were two or three in the studio. And then I'd have Julie Stein talking about writing people. And then I'd play people <laughs> and then, then I'd have Julie Stein talk about writing his very first song, Whatever Happened to the Guy with the Polka Dotted Tie. And then I'd play my recording of Julie Stein singing that song at my crappy piano in my living room. So did it have a lot of live performances? Uh, not so many. I remember once Steve Ross came to the studio and took requests over the air. That was, <laughs> I don't think that had ever been done before on radio. Steve Ross literally had an upright piano and I would say to him, uh, Joe Blow from Poughkeepsie would like to hear um, Anyone Can Whistle, the title song. Can you play that, Steve? Sure. And then he would literally play the title song from Anyone Can Whistle like a request over the air. And uh, that was great fun. We, we did a lot of silly things. I remember annually I used to have a contest and uh, the contest would be about two measures from a song, from a musical in succession. And I would make it as silly as I possibly could. And you'd hear, oh, and you'd have to recognize that that was, oh, what a beautiful morning from, from, uh, from you know, uh, Oklahoma. And uh, there were people who got 100% right on the quiz. And I thought, oh my God, these well, people Mike, know. Michael Colby. Michael Colby would be a, a, <laughs> someone. And Noel Katz. <laughs> and a lot of the songs don't start with identifiable 
like four notes, four notes for a lot of shows. I mean, I have no idea what they are. True. And, and I was usually, I was usually not that devious. I would usually play something where the listener could pretty much figure it out. Uh, but every once in a while, I throw in something so obscure that even the, the tried and true, you know, Broadway uh, collector would have a little difficulty. <laughs> you know, if, if you play something so obscure that uh, it's not even available commercially, let's say. Yeah, I, I would have asked, forget yourself a yo-yo. Do you know that song? <laughs> Probably not. It's from the amazing Adele with Tammy Grimes that closed in uh, Boston. Yeah, well, that's the kind of thing that would, <laughs> would be a stumper on, a, on one of these quizzes. But, uh, and uh, I don't even think the people won anything. I think the prize was uh, they the could, uh, <laughs> the prize was th their knowledge being uh, celebrated on my radio show. This is I a would announce their names. There's a radio show on WBAA now by a guy who uh, you know, has contests and he never gives any prizes. He just <laughs> recognizes you, acknowledges you. Have a, you have a, a lot of it is humorous titles and things like that. I have That's a friend, uh, Helen Rosenbaum, and she's a, a would-be lyricist and she can't come up with very funny you know, Donald <laughs> Trump or Biden uh, lines that uh, you know, could could be turned into a song title. Nice. But how, nice. how much theater did yeah, you actually, great. did you get a lot of free tickets as a result of this? Or did you follow Julie and say, I want to see One Night Stand, Julie? Fun, say. What? I'm having a bad connection. Is it, did, did you get free Sorry, tickets as a result of it? Did you occasionally get free yeah, tickets? I, I, I heard a little bit. I, all I got to, in those days, I, I, I definitely got some free tickets and books and, uh, as I said, records uh, and anything that came out that the music publisher wanted to try to promote, I would get sent in the mail. And at one point I had an enormous collection of uh, long playing albums. Um, I think I had 5,000 albums and uh, you know people would send me whole catalogs because I was the only show in New York City playing those records you know I, I remember getting the disco album of Broadway and hearing hearing uh, Ethel Merman sing the the disco version of the ballad of Sweeney Todd and Tom Shepard who produced that album explaining that they made the sound of cutting throats by slicing watermelons <laughs> Things like that. Are you so aware I would, I would she did, play these. Are you aware she did not sing to a disco? She sang to a piano and then they turned it into a disco record. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> she probably would have been horrified to hear the end result, maybe. What the hell was that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did well, you have stars come on too? Did you get the... Yeah, I occasionally. I, I It was not... Uh, it was not my focus. I have to. I, I do remember that um, I was endlessly being called by the publicists of the time to have, let's say, a Patti Lapone or or a Betty Buckley or you know uh, anybody of that ilk on the show. And truthfully, that was I felt that uh, that was for somebody else. I was much more interested in writers and directors and designers and people associated, I guess, behind the scenes, not so much on stage. You know, every once in a while, I would do a, a, a tribute to someone like Ethel Merman, as we were speaking. But even then, they were typically not on stage at the moment. They were long ago and famous. Um, I did, however, was very fortunate uh, I did many programs about Stephen Sondheim, obviously, and I was very fortunate that Angela Lansbury actually narrated a 60th birthday tribute in 1990. And, you know, that was certainly a, a good use of Angela Lansbury's gifts, and she was marvelous, as always. So I did have some, some luminaries, but I remember I was doing a program about the making of Lacajo Full, and I interviewed George Hearn, for example. 
Um, but not very few shows were devoted to performers. They were almost always writers or um, directors, you know, Arthur Lawrence or someone. What's sad and, and what's been an interesting journey for me is many of these shows involve people who are no longer with us. And uh, uh, that, you know, it's kind of sad. I mean, I, the, like for example, uh, this week, we're looking at Julie Stein and uh, you know, Julie Stein's not around anymore. It's kind of fun to hear him, his, ir his sort of irrepressible spirit, hear him come back to life. I have a, a meeting in which they discussed Pretty Bell. Oh. And that was very interesting to him. This is after the show had flopped, you know, I recorded it 10 years later, no one had ever gone back and tried to get the full original cast. Oh. The only person Charlotte Ray had had a small part, a featured part, but her song had been cut even in Boston. <laughs> and, that, and that cut song, I mean, Julie Stein was great. He had files, every, you know, every other composer had no idea what happened to the music. And in many cases, they were thrown away for show codes in Boston. It yeah, apparently burned. Julie Stein never threw away anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, there, there's that famous story about uh, the song in Gypsy. Uh, I guess it's You'll Never Get Away From Me in Gypsy. And uh, it had been previously <laughs> written as a different song in Ruggles of Red Cap called I'm in Pursuit, I'm in Pursuit of Happiness. And, you know, Sondheim is very chagrined to find out that he set a lyric to a, to a piece of music that had already been there's set. Another, there's, a, there's a second song. The thing is, this one was there was an album. I mean, most TV musicals did not turn into recordings. You know? Some did, but wow. so if it had been an unrecorded TV musical, then Sondheim would never have known. Well, somebody, somebody like you or me would have said, no, no, it was in uh, this show I saw. It. I have a reel to reel recording if you don't. <laughs> and apparently, and then, Sondheim was not aware of this. and. Uh, until opening night when somebody, I guess, gave him the recording of the old song. And uh, uh, it makes for a great story, but uh, I, 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 not many people really remember I'm in Pursuit of Happiness. <laughs> a lot of people remember You'll Never Get Away From Me. So I guess it's okay. But I think, I think Julie Stein's on, uh, there, was a, uh, there was an event at the Dramatist Guild and I, in which all of the creators of Gypsy um, spoke, and it was, you know, Arthur Lawrence and Stephen Sondheim and Julie Stein were all speaking about the development. And you hear Julie Stein talking about this piece of music that ended up in two shows. And he says, well, old songs never die. <laughs> and, and then you hear Sondheim laughing hysterically that <laughs> he didn't even admit that he'd already used that, that's a case of when you use a trunk tune, you better at least know if it's been used before. You know, he took a, a Sammy Kahn song lyric and he turned that into and Sammy went opening night to that show. And he said, I wrote a lyric to that melody. But of course, <laughs> a different lyric. And I believe the deal is that you have to share the royalty. That you, that's not me. I'm... Yeah, no, that's me. You have to share the royalty. So like I'm in Reserve of Happiness, Leo Robin, I believe, would have gotten half of the lyric writing, so. Really? Oh my God, and even you, from Gypsy. And you know the story of a West Side Story in the credits? Uh, the credits? Probably not. <laughs> uh, originally, Leonard Bernstein wanted to write all the lyrics. And right. between well, you and me, he wasn't as great a composer as he was. He was not the most brilliant lyricist you could hear. Right. Peter Pan with Gene Arthur, and there are no great lyrics there. You know? So uh, eventually somebody said, I think Arthur Lawrence had been to a backwards audition for Saturday night. He said, listen, you need some help, Lenny. <laughs> <laughs> so through the rehearsal period and before the rehearsal, Stephen Sondheim wrote the majority of the lyrics. So, but the, the billing was in Washington, the first tryout was lyrics by 
Stephen Sondheim and Leonard Bernstein. Oh my. <laughs> so he said to uh, Stephen Sondheim, he said, you know, we're gonna change that. And you'll, you'll, you'll get you know, full royalty. And Stephen Sondheim reportedly said, I don't care about the royalties. I only care about the credit. Well, I think half the, again, one quarter of a, uh, Gypsy uh, probably would have been worth saying a West Side Story. Gee, yes, yes, Maria, yes, I want, I want one percent of that. Wow. Well, you know, I mean, and uh, and you hear and you hear certain lyrics that probably were heavily influenced by Mr. Bernstein. <laughs> I think he had ideas for songs. It's one thing to have an idea for songs. Right. But, I mean, I think. Well, it's also Good. amusing. It's also amusing. Even someone as great as Leonard Bernstein um, uh, is at certainly writing and dealing with music. But uh, you know, there's also stories about Mass, which which was another show that originally I think he was going to write the lyrics for. And then I think he wrote in. the majority, and then his sister was his agent, and also Stephen Schwartz's agent. Oh, right. He said. Uh, I got a guy who wrote some uh, some uh, Godspell music. Uh, maybe he could. Uh, so I believe uh, a small. I don't know what percentage. Uh, twenty twenty <laughs> percent. I'm guessing that, 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 that she's forgetting. Well, it. I guess it, it just shows that when you start young, like Sondheim and Schwartz, you might have to share credit with uh, someone like Leonard Bernstein. Did you? Uh, did you ever interview orchestrators or even dance around? Oh yeah, very a lot. Uh, Michael Sturban uh, interviewed about uh, Sunday in the Park with George and other shows. Jonathan Tunick came on the show at one point. Um, I even had an interview with Hans Bialik oh. before he passed away. And you know, people don't even know that name, but great orchestrator. Was he able to remember that? Uh... Um, he was a little bit senile, but, but he, he remembered enough that it was an interesting, boy, that's, it's funny. There, there's an interview that's rare and that I just hadn't even thought about it, but I remember Hans Bialik sitting in my living room and you probably know better than me what shows he's famous for, but th he was probably in his 80s when I interviewed him. It was around the time of anything of um, uh, on your toes. Um, it came I back and must, he... maybe it was, maybe it was. Um, well, he did. Did he do the original on your toes? Yes. Okay. And so they, yeah, maybe it was the time because, you know, oftentimes uh, I would be approached by a publicist, so that would make sense because the publicist of on your toes might have suggested. I interview Hans Bialik, and very few people would even know who Hans Bialik was, you know, if not me, or, or certainly be willing to have him on the radio. You know, who is the most prolific orchestrator of them all? Lang? No. Oh, Robert Russell Bennett? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I guess he didn't have a current show, so you didn't interview him. But yeah, and <clears throat> I, I, I'm, I'm trying. When did he? When did he pass away? Early '80s, I believe. Oh, so I could have. Yeah. I, I guess towards the very end, I could have had him as a guest, but I did not. Uh, I was, certainly was aware of him. No, I, I was. Uh, I was much more uh, sitting down with the likes of Jonathan Tunick at the time because it was the heyday for them. Um, you know, there's many, many people one would, you know, of all the people I wish I had an opportunity to interview, high up on my list is Frank Lesser. Yes. And, uh, and let's say Johnny Mercer. And of course they were, they weren't around when I was, uh, the best. <laughs> I remember I did get to interview Ted Drachman, who was Lesser's, I guess, nephew or what would he have been? Uh, you know, but he wrote a bad off-Broadway musical. I forget the title of it, but uh, he wasn't much of a composer, but uh, maybe he had other uh, things he could do successfully. Well, he was a nice man. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think anyone who gets a piece uh, produced is, uh, it's a hard thing to do. So, and I, and I remember, I think Ted went to school or 
was friendly with Jed Fuhr, who was Cy Fuhr's son, and mm -hmm. uh, also uh, a very talented uh, songwriter, Jonathan Forster. They were all friendly, and I think they all went to Harvard together or something, and they all wrote for the Hasty Pudding Show or reviews that came afterwards, and, okay. you know. John Gloucester is still around. He's still composing. Yeah. yeah. He's very and, clever. Uh, He's very clever. Extremely clever. He once he once did something that I didn't think was possible. I asked him to write a song based on a lyric that appears in the play June Moon that was penned by George Kaufman and Ring Lardner. And the song is called Paprika. And it's supposedly, you know, June Moon is a, a play about Tin Pan Alley. And, uh, and you know, rumor has it, and, and it's been corroborated by his son, uh, Ring Lardner Jr., that Ring Lardner, the famous writer, was very much wanted to be a songwriter. But he never really got, he never really took off as a songwriter, but he had a trunk full of songs. And uh, so I was able to dip into that trunk for a production at Juilliard of June Moon. But one of the neatest things was John Forster, which is who we were talking about, wrote a lyric and music to a quatrain. The, 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 the song Paprika only exists in the play as a quatrain. It's just four lines. He wrote the rest of the song as if he were, as if he were Ring Lardner and George Kaufman. It was quite, quite lovely. And uh, the students at Juilliard uh, performed it as the scenery was being changed, kind of like flappers in the 20s. And uh, it was great fun. Mm -hmm. and, and John was in, certainly clever. Who was in the television version? Of June Moon. Well, I, I happen to know that <laughs> because, of course, it's Sondheim. And, uh, you have an idea how that happened? Uh, uh, I would not I'm, think well, it wasn't. Oh, I think I think I do know how that happened because I think it was Bert Shevelov who direct. I'm not sure, but you you can correct me if I'm wrong. But I think Bert Shevelov directed that, so I'm guessing he roped Sondheim into it. Right, right. Uh, because Bert Shevelov was had written for him, and so and was great great good friends with Sondheim, and uh, so I'm guessing that happened because of Bert Shevelov, but I I don't really know the story. All I know is that Sondheim looks tremendously uncomfortable playing the role. <laughs> he, he plays a songwriter? He plays, a, he plays Maxie, the songwriter, and he's, he's at the piano almost the entire time. And he's, it's a very sort of sarcastic Oscar Levant kind of role. <laughs> and uh, so on some level, Sondheim was very equipped to do it, but he, you can tell he just, what am I doing in front of the camera? You know, you can feel it in the whole performance. I would have it's said actually, too, are they going to really film this and preserve it? So hundreds of years from now, I'm going to be. Uh, <laughs> so, I didn't even think of that. I, like, I, show re me. I recorded when we did Pretty Bell. We got everybody back after ten years, and we had a week's rehearsal. So at the first first rehearsal, I had a little camcorder, and I filmed. And Angela had not seen this music in ten years. And she started to rehearse with Milton Rosenstock and the rest of the cast. And I'm filming this and she saw, but I'm sure in those days she didn't say, this is going to go on YouTube. <laughs> no, there's no YouTube. And it's one of the few things that I film that is on YouTube. If you type in Angela Lansbury, oh pretty well you see my recording, you see a hand, that's my hand. <laughs> the, the <laughs> pretty well close out of town and it must have, right? What? Did Pretty Bell close out of town? Yep, it only played Boston. It's a story that I would think anyone would have known was not going to go in Boston. Oh. It was a very, about her having sex with minority people to make up for her bigoted husband. Oh, That's right, not going right. to be today. So it, was a, it was sort of a racial uh, comment. It was meant to be humorous. Who wrote can, it besides Julie Stein? Um, Bob Merrill. Bob, he, oh, oh, so it, was it after Funny Girl? He, he did the book, and it was it was meant to be a small, intimate musical. But Alexander Cohen, who knew how to ruin almost any musical, you know, he took an evening of somebody, and that he couldn't ruin because he let them do it the way it was originally done. But he so overproduced it, oh. and had Gower Champion doing 
a rape ballet. Boston did not want to see a rape ballet, and you know. Oh wow, <laughs> that sounds like sounds like Hallelujah, Baby. Well, that you know. I guess, I guess there was a whole period of musicals attempting to bridge the racial gap and, uh, and everybody feeling quite proud of themselves for, for you know, having people of color on the stage. My, have we come a long way since then. Did you see No Strings? Uh, I, never saw, I, I never saw the original, certainly. And uh, I've seen... Um, I've seen various concerts versions of it, and I've seen uh, an attempt at a staging of it, but that was quite bad. And uh, but I obviously never saw never saw the original. No. So when, when when I saw I remember Mama, I thought this is probably Richard Rogers' last show, and it certainly looked like no one was going to record it. So I looked into recording it and. Uh, at one point, uh, I thought uh, maybe uh, Robert Russell Bennett would want to reorchestrate it. Wow. So I visited him. He lived at the Warwick Hotel for quite a few years by the time. Mm. You, you, you could have interviewed him. He was at the Warwick. And, uh, I'll bet I could have, yeah. I didn't. I'm sad that I didn't. And he said, unfortunately, uh, I'm too old. I appreciate the offer, but I'm too old. And, uh, eventually, John Yap uh, got Bruce Pomahack from the Rogers office to orchestrate it. And, yeah. Sure. Both, had, of, both, of, both of whom I know. He had done the Fly With Me that I put out. I went to see the 50th anniversary of Fly With Me in 1970, I think. Wow. And uh, there was a sign at Columbia University. This is the same theater, it had been done 50 years ago. And there was a sign saying, if you want the cast album, give us your name or a deposit, I don't know what, yeah. I was learning that there was gonna be a cast album. But I thought, well, I'll wait and get it at Sam Goody's for a reduced price. So my wife, who was about to be my ex-wife, weeks later called me and she said, uh, I just made a deal to record, to issue the tapes. Coming University had taped the show. And I said, Doris, my, my wife was not on top of things. I said, Doris, don't you remember there was a sign saying that New World, the New World Records was going to record it? Oh. She said, well, I don't know what happened, but they gave it to me. And she said, if you're nice to me, I'll let you put it out. <laughs> so indeed, something had happened, and indeed, uh, through her uh, wow. not knowing that uh, you know, uh, it, it, it should have been on New World Records, she got it. And, uh, we got all these tapes and uh, we had a, a friend, Stuart Triff, who worked at uh, King Carroll. He was the buyer at King Carroll on uh, 42nd Street. <laughs> and uh, we just edited the, the, the uh, tapes and uh, put it out. And uh, you know, it's Quite a wonderful recording. Uh, I don't think I even, I don't think I ever got that one, or, or maybe I did. Yeah. I should have. <laughs> so did. Um, and ori originally, though it appeared in the twenties, I was told that they orchestrated the Columbia shows were all like a jazz band. Mm -hmm. They were not done in a Broadway manner. That was the. We don't want any of those small C kind of things. We want everything to be jazzy. Right. But Richard Rogers had just died as they were going to do their show, and Bruce Pomack said, I'm going to do this with a full orchestra and do it as if this was. Wow. And so this is the first recording with an orchestra. I guess we're seeing the end of the era because now that I, I saw that Ted Chapin is stepping down from his 40 years of running the Rogers and Hammerstein estate uh, office. I have a feeling that's not a good thing. It, no, I have a feeling that's not a good thing. It's going to lead to less being done of what we'd want to have done and things being done that we would not want done yeah, in the particular right. yeah. way they have in mind. I really think that I did not yeah. see the new Oklahoma. Did you see the revised I Oklahoma? I did not see it. Where Judd takes a gun and shoots. 
Oh, I, I heard Curly, about it, but I didn't get it. Curly to takes a gun out, and yeah. Roger Hammerstein did not envision. I mean, there is a, a tussle, as they say, for the gun, but it's a fair fight. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> it could have gone either way, but if you take out a gun and six or eight feet away, you go boom. That's a whole different story. Right. Did Judd oh. deserve it? I don't know. He had it coming. He had it coming. He had it coming. <laughs> I know. L listen, uh, you could you could debate that topic for hours, um, hours. The uh, there was a recent uh, Glass Menagerie which featured Laura in a wheelchair. You know, uh, and uh, I didn't see it, so I have no grounds from which to speak. But I don't think that's what Tennessee Williams had in mind. So, no, but um, I, I, I'm much more in favor of that. <laughs> My personal thing is, you know, she she was crippled in many ways, and that's just a physical manifestation that you know, she you know, was not able to uh, you know do things in a normal way because of her mind, and in this case, her her body. Uh, you know. so what what in all the musicals you've seen? What's the worst musical you've ever seen? The <laughs> worst musical I've ever seen? Oh, I don't know. I'm sure there's many, but uh, I, you know, I, I have to say, uh, I'm not, I, I don't know if I could come up with the absolute worst musical I've ever seen, but I, I have to say, I'm not a gigantic fan of the so-called jukebox musical. So, you know, I know many people love this format, I am partial to storytelling. And when the storytelling is subservient to the catalog of, of, uh, of the songs, uh, it usually leaves me quite cold. So uh, I, guess, I, I guess I would say, I'll take any story done badly over a non-story musical. Um, and you know, and there's different ways to tell stories. It's funny, uh, an upcoming guest is gonna be Richard Malpe Jr. who, you know, created maybe one of the greatest jukebox uh, musicals of all time in Ain't Misbehaving, but he somehow captured the essence of Fat Wall Fats Waller, and I think that's difficult to do. Uh, so I think that's a storytelling in a different manner. But I have seen, I have seen so many of these shows that are simply catalogs of music, and and I think there's more to come. Uh, because there's plenty of catalogs of music that haven't been explored yet. And the storytelling is literally to serve the songs, not the other way around. And I'm not a big fan of that. So I guess way up there on my list of worst musicals I've ever seen are, are most of the jukebox musicals. But there's the one exception, and again, I tried to see every musical. I saw every musical from Breakfast at Tiffany's, which I missed. To where I stopped seeing musicals, which was that <clears throat> uh, SpongeBob the musical and Escape to Margaritaville. I said these <laughs> musicals should not be seen by any. Well, adult. Escape to Margaritaville is a is a class. I didn't even, I didn't see it, so I have no opinion. Right. But Escape to Margaritaville is a classic example of somebody's catalog being turned into a musical. It was you know. And the composer what I gather, behind this, I think he or friends of his backed it. So it's not like somebody else said, we love your music. I love, my, you know, I love my music. And they said in one of the reviews, I think even the New York Times maybe, that uh, they serve liquor at the palace and uh, be sure you imbibe some of it uh, to get through. <laughs> so I said, no, this is not a musical I'm, I'm going to see. <laughs> You know, but I but I've had some I've had some fabulous experiences lately. I loved seeing Once. I very much enjoyed Dear Evan Hansen. I very much enjoyed uh, Wicked. I very you know I've had some really good experiences recently. Uh, ones that I found quite moving in modern musicals. I, I'm not I'm not a fan, and I've had many many guests who who you know basically moan about the good old bad old days. And uh, I have to say, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of that sort of retrograde attitude of, oh, if only we were back in the heyday of Hello Dolly. Uh, that's not me. Uh, and I don't have anything against Hello Dolly. I, 
I can take it or leave it, but it's not, it's not a show that, that, you know, it's, it's not, uh, I'm not going to faint because Bette Midler is doing Hello Dolly. I'm just not. So when I hear people go on and on and on about how the musical is deteriorated beyond belief and, and uh, nothing is happening, I, I don't agree. I just don't agree. I, I, if, you listen to, if you listen carefully to what's going on in Dear Evan Hansen, it's filled with ingenuity and creativity and, uh, and melodic gifts. And if, you, if you're not capable of hearing that, you're probably somebody who didn't like West Side Story when it first came out either. And, and because it had a tritone in one of the big songs. Well, you know what? Our ears grow older. <laughs> and the tritone of 59 is now the most hummable song ever. You know, we, we talk about Maria as being this immensely hummable song. It starts with a tritone. No one had ever written a tritone in a Broadway musical before, except Leonard Bernstein. And, you know, I just get so tired of the same people who are now lauding West Side Story don't understand that when West Side Story came out, people were horrified by a tritone. It's like Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. You know, there were riots when it first debuted, but now it's considered a classic. It's, it's like, I, I, I guess I have to say, I just get tired of people defending the old because usually they're just ill-informed. The thing, the thing that I like with the old shows is that you see what it's like to have a really big orchestra. Hmm. So for well, that, a big orchestra is, is an economic situation, pretty much. The, the, only, the only reason we don't have a big orchestra is because people can't afford or they say they can't afford it. Well, I, I would rather cut down on costs somewhere else. I would, I would sooner cut down on a number of chorus people or eliminate some stage hands. <laughs> well, they're doing that. <laughs> they're doing that too. But, but also when you come to stage hands, they're very, very heavily unionized and very protected. No, you, you can't at this point do that. Unless, yeah. You know, It'd be a three-year strike, and uh, when you when you hear the numbers on on a load in of a Broadway show now, it's it's unfathomable the, the amount of money, and 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 you know I, I as a director I've experienced that a little bit. It's it's a it's a question of budget, you know. If uh, Richard Nelson, a fabulous lighting designer, who I worked with, and uh, once explained to me that the economics. I remember we were doing a show called Personals together. And uh, I had never really gotten to work with someone who had as many Broadway credits as Richard Nelson in the lighting design world. And at, at one point I kind of looked up and he had so many lights in the air, I was flabbergasted. I mean, hundreds. And I said to him, Richard, we're in this small theater. Why are there 400 lights in the air? And he said, Paul, here, here's the, here's, the explanation that you don't know. Many of those lights aren't even on. And I said, what? He said, putting them up now is cheaper than putting them up when the, or changing the bulb in the light. Because when you do the numbers, it's, it's cheaper economically to put it up now, have it turned off and turn it on when you need it than it is to fix the one that the bulb blew out. It's and like I said, having all the colors on a palette and you can have any color, they're there. You may not right. use all well, of this, them. These, these were in the days before changeable color was a, uh, you know, unfortunately nowadays you can change the color of a light with a flick of a button. In those days you, you couldn't, you had to actually change the gel, which means somebody getting paid a lot of money goes up in the air and has to change the gel, <laughs> or if the bulb burns out, they have to put a new bulb in. The cost of that pro was prohibitive to someone like Richard Nelson. It was easier to put four lights in the air and have three of them off, <laughs> which, which, is, which is unfortunately a really bad indication of, of uh, the incorrect balance of power. Uh -huh. How did that show come together? Because there were quite a few up and coming writers. It was sort of a review, would you call it? Yeah, a it, was review? Very, it was very, it was very much a review, but 
I insisted that it hold together. And uh, I, uh, as the director, you know, luckily that, re that show came together because the very, very soon to be famous writers, David Crane, Marta Kaufman, and at the time, um, Seth Friedman had been together at Brandeis. They had been in college and they'd written a, a show called Personals. And it was a very embryonic version of what you saw off Broadway, but it was the basic idea. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, musically anywhere near as sophisticated. And, and frankly, I asked a couple of friends to come in and write some music. They're, the friends were Alan Menken and Stephen Schwartz. And Michael Sklaff, who is now uh, you know, being celebrated as the writer of the song, I'll Be There For You, the theme from Friends, Michael Sklaff also said a few of the lyrics, both new and old to music. So basically three composers were added to the team and then a lot of rewriting was done. And, uh, and for example, I insisted that there be a finishing song to the review, a song that summed up everything that the audience had seen up to then. And um, it took a long time, but it basically became the song, sometimes some things don't end. <laughs> That's what we, we came up with as a line that could sum, summarize personals. Well, Stephen Schwartz wrote the music for that. He's pretty gifted. <laughs> and David Crane, Marta Kaufman, and Seth Friedman wrote the lyrics. And uh, so it evolved that way. And, and then, you know, and then, you know, that's one of the greatest casts I've ever had as a director. Every single person on that stage was remarkable. Tell us who some of those people were. Oh, the, some of those, pe those people were Jason Alexander. Trey Wilson is no longer with us, sadly. Um, Jeff Keller, who for many years was in Phantom on Broadway. Uh, the three women were Dee Hody, Nancy Opal, and Laura Dean. Uh, mm -hmm. Names I hope you know, but if you don't yeah. know, Laura Dean was the young woman in uh, the movie of fame who almost, you think she's gonna commit suicide and then she throws her sneakers on the train. That's Laura Dean. Nancy Opal, I think has been in 20 plus Broadway shows at, at this point and is maybe best remembered as uh, uh, <laughs> in Sunday in the Park with George, she's the nanny. Um, and also she's been in many, many, many shows and, and Dee Hody again, you know, it's basically, these are Broadway superstars, in my opinion, and had all of them, had all six of them in one cast. It was a very, very positive experience for me. But it was not ultimately terribly successful, right? It, well, it ran for a year, which is pretty good. <laughs> did, did they get, it made its money back, would you guess? Oh, I doubt it. <laughs> uh, I doubt it made its money back. Um, but it, it did run for a year, and it was, you know, it's critically you know, like success esteem, I guess. Um, but it won a lot of awards and, and it's probably most notable for spawning the careers of David and Marta who, who now have tucked away friends under their belts. And the TV show Friends is probably one of the most successful TV shows in history. Have you, ever heard, of a, have you ever heard of a song called She Makes Me Laugh? Uh, I think it might have been written by the people from Friends. And I've, yet, I've, been, I've recorded this song, huh. and yet I do not know. I'd, at one time, I did know. I don't know. It was know 10 it. years ago, and it, it's, it's sung on uh, my recording of Lost Broadway and more. Hmm. It's sung I wonder, by, it's, I wonder if it was uh, for one of their other shows. It's by, sung by Tom Hewitt. Played Dracula with most Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I know Tom you I saw. recognize his name. I didn't even know the name of the person. I did. saw that Dracula. Um, but um no, I I I, I certainly don't know him. The idea of the song is really good that deal. You know, he mentions all the idea of the song, I think, is so brilliant. The idea of the song is that this woman is just infuriating. He mentions all the bad things about this woman. Uh -huh. And then he says, she makes me laugh. Uh -huh. And that yeah. is what's endearing. And he said, I, I have to stay with her. Hmm. That is Sounds a brilliant, 
a brilliant idea. So maybe someday, somebody, I've asked many people about that song, and uh, you know, eventually someday we'll say, of course, I, I say. <laughs> they run into the Tom Hewitt. I'm sure he would remember. He would know. She yeah. makes me laugh. I'll yep. ask, I could ask uh, David. Okay. I'll ask him to see if I get you an answer. But you, it's, it's not credited on the recording as to who wrote it? Well, again, people came in, we had the music, then I had a falling out with the guy who brought in the music, oh. and he doesn't want to be bothered telling me. Oh. And it's such okay. a good song that I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to put it out. And, uh, you know, eventually somebody will identify it. And uh, I now I'll produce see if I, things. I'll see, I'll see if I can find out who wrote it. I produce things in very small quantities today. So uh, the next time I do it, I can say written by Stephen Sondheim or whoever happened to have written it. Okay. Huh. Do you, what do you think of theater in California? Uh, well, you know, it, it, this is a tough time because theater has been shut down everywhere for over a year. Um, I think there's a, a, a very healthy uh, theater scene in California and um, it's, it's underrated because LA is not known as a theater town, but I'm telling you a lot of people uh, who start on Broadway and off Broadway, um, but got to a certain age have moved to Los Angeles because they're in the TV or film industry and they have families or partners they've been with a very long time and they don't wanna be completely poor. So they're working in television and film, but all of those people are involved in what is called LA theater and so there's a very vibrant, interesting scene. Um, I'm part of a theater company called Antius Theater Company. And uh, you know it has the likes of Dakin Matthews and Harry Groner and Ari Gross. These are fabulous, fabulous actors. Um, and uh, all of them have major Broadway credits uh, and they happen to be living in Los Angeles. You know, I mean, Harry Groner should be a name that, that many people should know. Dakin Matthews was just on Broadway in uh, the revival of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird playing the judge. Uh, these are not uh, newcomers, <laughs> but they're in LA. And so when they do a play, and let's say it's Dakin Matthews in King Lear or Harry Groner in Uncle Vanya, uh, it's quite something. And uh, so be very careful how you uh, how you treat Los Angeles theater, because first of all, most of the actors aren't LA based, they're from New York <laughs> and they've moved out here and they're pursuing things they care about, whether it's Shakespeare, Chekhov or August Wilson. And uh, uh, it can be very, very good. It, you know, and it also can be horrifyingly bad, uh, especially what I call the vanity productions where people are only doing theater as a way to get a TV or film job. And those productions, you should run, you, should, you shouldn't go. <laughs> and if you go by accident, run screaming out of the theater at intermission. Um, and uh, we have plenty of that too, but unfortunately that's not just LA. <laughs> There's plenty of that in other parts of the world. Right. Why do you think we, we've gone from the, the days of a Boston and Philadelphia. Oh, Haven. I just pure, I just pure economics. I, I, I think. Why is it more economical to do a musical in California and then bring it back versus going well, to Well, because Haven? usually the, either the theater or the commercial producer is subsidizing that production. Wow. So typically, let's say, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, Old Globe Theater in San Diego is is very known for being a kind of out of town tryout theater for a Broadway show. Uh, most recently, they were trying out the musical based on uh, Almost Famous, the movie by Cameron Crowe, right? right? And, you know, it was a very lavish pre Broadway production, the kind you would have seen in the Colonial in Boston or somewhere in Philadelphia, um, New Haven, you know, in the old days. It's basically the regional theater is giving the real estate, meaning the theater, some producers spending 
less than a million dollars or less than $2 million to get a chance to look at the show before they spend 12, 15, 20 million dollars. So it's, I think it's a purely economic gesture. It's, uh, it's driven by the fact that you can get a look at a show prior to the New York critics for a lot less money. I think that's what, it, I, I don't think there's any other more complicated answer. Because all the unions have regional theater prices, which are not Broadway. Right, and well, and, and you know, but getting into the union question, there's nowhere near the expense, the union expense in a theater like the Old Globe at San Diego versus the Winter Garden in, in, in the heart of Broadway. There's no, it's nowhere near a comparison. It's, it's apples and oranges. Uh, so that too, but again, economic. Going back, seeing how I'm gonna many- I'm going to have to, unfortunately, I'm going to have to depart pretty soon. So if you okay, have other well, questions. We'll, we'll wrap it up, I'm saying. I've looked back, you know, in the early days of, of various theaters and some shows, some theaters would have five, six musicals, one word after another, they'd, they'd move and two weeks later, they'd move somewhere else and that's, Mm. It's so impractical today that uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, when you see the numbers for a load in or a load out, it is it is absolutely obvious why productions don't move. It's so cost prohibitive to take the scenery alone and move it to another space. Uh, it, it's 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 in the millions. It's not it's not an expense that most producers are willing to spend money on, which is why you see a big theater. hit. I mean, Chicago and Beauty and yeah. the made so much money that ultimately it was economical to move. And also, if you look, look at Chicago, mostly costume, very, very little scenery. You know, it's, it, it was, you know, it was originally a, a concert production that became a Broadway show, very little scenery. So I imagine that's, functioning in the cost analysis of moving that show. Because how hard is it to move a few costumes? Not the same as moving a big heavy piece of so scenery. So we tell the actors, put three or four costumes out and meet me at the new theater. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. Do, you don't even do, have to do, move Do you have any aspirations? Can you carry your costume with you? <laughs> you carry numerous costumes. Not just yeah, exactly. Well, there you go. Would you like to bring a show to New York? Is that all in here? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, listen, uh, uh, Broadway is, you asked, the very first question you asked is where did this begin? Began on Broadway, began with company, uh, company and I saw Funny Girl, I saw Company, uh, I saw Barbara Streisand, you know, those are the shows that uh, make me who I am and uh, would I want to be up, uh, would I want to have, make something that's on that stage? Absolutely, no question about it. And in fact, I spend a great deal of time uh, working on plays or ideas that I think can become Broadway shows. I'm working on one right now, so. Well, again, we thank you very much for giving us your time and uh, you do something in New York and it's a musical, I'll probably come and see it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Bruce. Bye. Nice to bye see bye. you as well. Bye. bye. Well, I'm not well, kidding. If you listen to any of that. Okay, there's nothing interesting to look at. I don't know. You pretend to be interesting. Yeah, I'm interesting.